G'day guys, welcome back to another Fair Income episode. In today's episode, we spoke with none other than Samir, as some of you guys might know him on Instagram as Al Habashi. Um, we spoke about him growing up in downtown Toronto, in, around that lifestyle in Regent Park. We also spoke about um, just a light episode in regards to the NBA, the game-winning shot with Kawhi Leonard in Game 7, the vibes in Toronto. Um, we also spoke about, in regards to the Dean, um, the importance of understanding the fundamentals you know, and not making the dean really hard on yourself. Um, as well as he touches on his mentorship, uh, Hadith Disciple, Mufti Munir. Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment the whole lot, and just go. Or, you know, told, you know, do this for me or do that for me, because that's how it usually starts. Yeah. Older heads to- tells a young guy, yo, hold this for me. Yeah. You know, do the And the kid, sometimes he's just thinking, all right, I'm going to hold it. You know, doesn't really realize, like, the severity of what they're getting themselves into. They're told, okay, do this, hold this, I'm going to come back for this, take this over there, there's someone there, he's going to pick it up. Next thing you know, he does a couple of times, next thing he, can, he finds out that this guy gives him $100, $200, right? He's never seen that type of money in his life. Thank you. By the way, guys, there's 80% of you guys who watch our videos are actually not subscribed. So... <laughs> Stop the video right here. <laughs> My voice cut out. Stop the video right here. Subscribe. I'll give him a second. Now we can resume the video. Enjoy. G'day guys. Welcome back to another Fade Income episode. We haven't done this in a while. Um, Loki last night I was in the bathroom trying to practice this bit. Just trying to say. We're a bit rusty on this hot minute. But we'll start with a hot minute. Basically, Ahmed chucked the time on. He's going to put a little edit in. And today's hot minute. Obviously, you're from Toronto. You know, and we were at basketball the other week. We were, we were playing around with some Canadian slang and stuff. So today, we're going to play around with a little bit of um, Australian slang. You know, so in this hot minute, just guess what you think this means, all right? Oh, yeah. So first of all, this is an easy start, yeah? Maccas. That's McDonald's. Beautiful. What do you guys call it over there? McD's? McDonald's or Mickey D's. Mickey D's. Yeah. <laughs> so all right. Um, Why do they make it longer? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it's easier to say McDonald's, yeah? I'm sorry. All right. Um, check the time on the actual <laughs> episode, not in real life. This is pressure. <laughs> um, naked. Mm, oh, tired. Oh, you're good. Hard yakka. Hard yakker. <laughs> hard yakka. Hard yakka. <laughs> Never heard that before. Never heard of it. <laughs> it's like hard work. Okay. Um, mate's rate. Mate's rate? Yeah. I don't know what your friend charges you <laughs> for help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this will finish it off with this one. Uh, fair income, mate. Fair income, mate. Yeah. Oh, this is embarrassing, man. I'm coming yeah. on the fair income podcast. <laughs> I don't even know what fair income means. Fair income, uh, does it mean like all right? Uh, you could say that, but it's more of a fair enough. Like it's more of a no way. A no way. You know what I mean? Like you tell me, like I'm the Jordan of Australia, and yeah. I say fair, fair income. income. <laughs> like that, that, that's the type of the way that it is. But yeah, thank you for the one, uh, the hot minute. We'll start into the episode there. So, Samir, welcome to the um, um, into the podcast. This is your first ever podcast, hey? Yeah, it's my first ever podcast. You've been in front of cameras all your life, but not all your life for the last couple of years. Yeah, first ever time, yeah. Yeah, alhamdulillah, it's first podcast, man. Allahu Appreci- buddy. Appreciate you guys inviting me here and having me. Inshallah. Allahu buddy. We'll get we'll get straight into it. I w- I wanted to hear if you've had some experiences with like Aussie slang. Or even like an accent, or you just didn't understand it when you first came here. Just when, because when, when you brought this out, I was like, you know, I just in my head I started thinking of all these other examples. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, of course, my wife is from Australia, so uh, I've been exposed to the Australian slang for some time now, mm. even before coming to Australia. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of noticed that you guys don't really like move your lips when you talk. Yeah. yeah like we're lazy with it. Yeah. You just. Far out, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Check a yeah. check a Yui, mate. <laughs> like I kind of noticed that you guys don't really <laughs> move your lips, so maybe that's why the, com- the sound comes out like that. Us as Australians, we're known for like making everything short, like just shortcuts and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it means not moving your lips, that's one less muscle, you know. Or there's like sixty <laughs> muscles in you, or whatever. But that's like it makes it ten times easier yeah. for you, you know. He's observant. I love yeah. Very, very Allah. observant. So we wanted to touch on just a little bit. Um, about you, um, just like your story for those obviously that don't know about you and whatnot. So you're born and raised in Toronto? So I was born, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, wa salatu salam ala nabiyyil kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I was actually born in Saudi Arabia. 
Oh, you're born in Saudi? I was born in Riyadh, yeah. Saudi Arabia. But we moved to Canada when I was three years old, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, lived in Toronto for a majority of my life. Yeah, grew up there. Grew up in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Regent Park. Yeah. You know. Uh, Regent Park? Regent Park. Okay. Yeah. You, kn- you know Regent, eh? No, nah, but Regent Street is like the next <laughs> street. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> Regent <laughs> Station, yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah so I, 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 we lived in an area before, uh, in another area in Toronto before Regent Park. But we moved to Regent Park, like, uh, I think it was in 02 or 03, mm-hmm. 2002 or 2003, and lived most of my childhood there and, you know, adolescence and stuff like that and uh, grew up there with, you know, family and friends and stuff. I've always got confused between this, yeah? Because I've got cousins in Canada as well. You know when they say, like, I live in, what is it, like, uptown Toronto or downtown Toronto downtown. and stuff? What is that? What's the difference? So downtown just means the, 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 the center of the city. Yeah. Um, so Regent Park is in downtown. So it's closer to the city. Yeah, it's, it's actually in the city. It's downtown. Yeah. It's in the city. Yeah. Um, so downtown, you could say it's like the equivalent of the city here, mm. right? Downtown is the city, and then you have the suburbs in the east and in the west and in the north and stuff like that. So it's like the inner suburbs for yeah. us. That's like the equivalent type of thing. Yeah, yeah It's basically. a little bit closer and stuff. Yeah. I've heard a lot about Regional Park. I'm not going to lie to you, but obviously for not the good side of Regional Park, you know? Yeah. Like the, 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 the housing commissions over there. The shootings, the gang rivalries, and all that kind of stuff. So you grew up in that sort of lifestyle. Yeah, Achi. Um, <laughs> I didn't grow up in the lifestyle, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I grew up around it, bro. You yeah. know, um, Subhanallah. It was. Uh, I mean, looking back, obviously you, you enjoyed your childhood and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, generally speaking, as a child, you don't really understand what's going on around you, what's happening, and stuff like that until you kind of grow up. But uh, yeah, in Regent Park, Achi, um, you know. People there, the youth there, the ch- kids there, they're exposed to things, uh, you know, v- very early on in their life, um, whether it's death, whether it's um, tragedy mm-hmm. uh, of any kind, poverty, stuff like that. Um, yeah, definitely, Regent Park is filled with those things. You know, when I was just doing a little bit of, um, like, research into you and stuff, and you're telling me about, what do you call it, Regent Park, we have, like, a similar, like, we have those type of, like, commission areas, because, like, in Australia, you've got areas, like, like North Melbourne, like Heidelberg and like the inner suburbs, like the downtown regions mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of those regions, they have like high rises, like flats and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And they dedicate it specifically like to immigrants mm-hmm. and whatnot. Is that like how Regent Park was? Yeah. So uh, when Regent Park was first built um, back in the day, um, I mean, I've heard this before and I've read this before that Regent Park is, was the first um, housing complex yeah. in North America. Yeah. But at that time, wow. there was no immigrants, right? Um, and as time went on, uh, you know, they started to, uh, you know, bring more immigrants into those areas and stuff like that, low-income families. And, uh, yeah, so it's a combination. Regional Park's a combination of flats. You guys would call flats apartment buildings. Yeah, we don't call yeah. them flats. Apartment buildings and also, like, townhouses and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, uh, two-story townhouses, um, you know. Yeah, so how about the... How about the Type of the demographic that was there because you said there weren't really immigrants that was back then. How about now when you were growing up? Was it because obviously you're East African, was yeah. it filled with people that are East African? Was it kind of mixed with subcontinental Europeans? What was that kind of like the demographic? So I actually just found out recently that uh, when we were growing up before uh, Regional Park went through gentrification, uh, it was about 60% Bengali, right? 60%. Wow. 60% Bengali. We had a lot of Bengalis in the area, and um, that's why there was like basic a musalla. At the mm. bottom of every uh, building, yeah. you uh-huh. know, uh, there's a lot of Bengalis, a lot of East Africans, especially mm. Somalis, yeah. um, and also uh, people from like uh, Caribbean background, yeah. Jamaicans. Um, you know, uh, there'd also be white people too. Yeah. So like, what is musalla a Bengali thing? Hmm. You say no, no, musalla I meaning it's just like a small little uh, like place to pray in the bottom of the building. Gotcha. Usually, they don't pray Juma there. They yeah. just have their uh, five daily prayers and stuff like it's that. It's not big enough, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's just a small little thing. Yeah convenient for you to go down and pray and then yeah that's a lot of muslims man how about you growing up because obviously now you're saying 60 percent which is more than half of the people are muslim was it an environment where kids growing up were like it was normal to be a practicing muslim going five salats at the musalla you know or was it more like you guys you know like obviously you know when you're young mm-hmm. and getting into sports sometimes you get distracted you're not really studying the deen every single mm-hmm. day you know like how was that growing up what was that journey for you so in our area in region park um uh, the masjid, Masjid Umar bin Khattab, uh, uh, was there, um, you know, since I believe uh, uh, 98, 
I believe 98 or 99. So uh, the masjid uh, is an integral part of the community. Um, you know, it's the same masjid that I do khutbahs in now and classes and stuff like that. It's the same masjid that I grew up in and I literally learned, you know, the basics of, basics of Islam, memorize Quran in that masjid with our Sheikh, Sheikh Bukhari. So a lot of the Muslim youth would, you know, start off in the masjid, whether it's duksi, Quran yeah. classes and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, summer schools and uh, summer programs and whatnot. So uh, the masjid was a big part of the community. People would go there and the masjid would try their best to have activities and programs for the youth and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I was telling Abdulwali uh, last night that, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, basically in, in Regent Park now, if you see all the different brothers who've come out, brothers and sisters that have come out and, you know, they're doing different things, mashallah, on a, on a big scale, um, whether Islamic or non-Islamic, whatever it may be, um, they all started off in Mashallah Amir Khattab, mm-hmm. right? We all have the same Allah. teacher, same role model, Sheikh Bukhari. And, um, you know, if you ask any of those uh, brothers and sisters, they all say the same thing about Sheikh Bukhari and the masjid and how it was so important to them when they were growing up and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, the masjid was very close to my house. It was literally like a two, uh, two-minute walk from my, from my house. And um, I really spent a lot of time there. And I spent a lot of time playing sports in the hood and, like, you know, playing basketball and stuff like that. We had this, there's this court in Regional Park. It's still there now. It's called Cage Court. Is that is that the one that you you kept on uploading videos initially on your Instagram with the one with the blue net on the bottom? It's got the rusty old rim to it. Is it was it outdoors? It's an outdoor court. Might be in Medina. Mm. Like Medina? Nah, it looks like <laughs> a, it looks like a. Canadian. Is there a cage around? Yeah, there it? is a cage around. So there. it's probably cage court. Oh, it's cage yeah, court. Yeah. Is so that in Regent? That's in Regent Park. That's yeah. in like uh, in Southside. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like uh, it's a central part of Regent yeah. Park. Um, that's where we used to play. It's yeah. outdoor. It's literally uh, surrounded by a cage, yeah. and um, I think it was, uh, it was, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think Vince Carter had something to do with the court. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he either came and they fixed up the court or something like that through him, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's like a double rim, Yeah. so uh, basically for you know guys yeah. who don't really play basketball, That's the uh, a double rim is like a hard rim to shoot on, yeah. right? It either has to be a swish or it's going to like clank off it's gonna go really hard off the rim that's why you're a shooter uh that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> not really but but yeah so we grew up we all grew up playing ball in re- in cage court and um you know uh we spent a lot of time playing basketball there and also in the community centers there's a there's a north side center mm-hmm. and south side center so north center and south center depending on regional park was a big area mm-hmm. like there's a lot of people like i can't i can even if i look back now um I can really see that I spent most of my time growing up in South Side because yeah. that's the side that I lived on, mm-hmm. as opposed to North Side. Obviously, I went to North Side a lot, yeah. but it was so big that you know people were really just staying in their area yeah. within Regent Park. That's how big Regent Park was. Mm. So you got South Side, North Side, and then the masjids like that. That um, it's called common ground, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So people from North Side, people from South Side, everyone would come to the masjid to pray. Yeah. Um, like I said, there was mu- small musallas in in Regent Park, yeah. but generally speaking, people would would um you know come to the masjid and, and, and pray there, Jamaah prayer yeah. and stuff like that. It was a really like a, a nice meetup place and a place to link up with, you know, with the brothers and everybody. And uh we spent a lot of time in the masjid. Mm. Like we spent a lot of time in the masjid growing up. Um and spent a lot of time, like I said, yeah. playing sports and stuff like that. The masjid had like a soccer team. We used to play right there was a soccer field uh, right in front of the masjid. So we'd literally pray Asr. After Asr put our cleats on. I used to play soccer actually. Yeah. You know? And uh, we used to play soccer from Asr to Maghrib, and then Maghrib time, when the Adhan goes off, we, you know, just before the Adhan, we'd get ready and oh, no. go back into the masjid and play, uh, and pray, not play. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or play. Yeah, and then play after. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, with like region and stuff, I want to tap into this, because mm. like a lot of um, the news that you hear about region park is like often like the bad rep that he gets for, you know, like in regards to like the gangs, the hood life and all that kind of stuff. Um, so growing up in that environment, and then being the man you are today, like how do you sort of avoid that lifestyle? So first of all, I know a, a couple couple of your mates would have been about that, or, or even if you want to tap into some like yeah. stories and stuff in regards to that. Yeah, okay. So first and foremost, of course, it's uh, it's the tawfiq of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's you know uh, protection for uh, me and for the other brothers. Mm. Uh, alhamdulillah, that we're able to avoid those things. <sighs> but okay, um there's a lot there was a lot going on in Regent Park. Yeah. A lot of things like I said that we may not have understood at that time. Um first time, you know, just to give you one example, first time I was kind of exposed to death or yeah. the idea of someone I know dying 
was uh, when I was 15. Mm. So I was in uh, grade 10 yeah. in math class. It was first period. We're in class. It was the day after Halloween. Yeah. And subhanAllah, one of the sisters in the class, this was in high school, and she was like, you know, so-and-so uh, died last night. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the brothers, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him. Yeah. And you knew him personally? Yeah, yeah. Grew up with him. Yeah. Knew him personally. Um, I remember when I was 13, mm -hmm. he gave me like the hardest birthday beats. Yeah. Like he was he punching me, punching me, gave me 13 punches. Yeah. I lifted up my sleeve and I saw my, my whole arm was uh, purple. Yeah. 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 And he was, uh, he was, mashallah, he was loved by everybody. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah. mashallah, beautiful family. Uh, and, you know, subhanAllah, just, uh, you know, it's unfortunate what yeah. happened. But of course, it's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was, did he die due to being about that life or was it just. Natural? No, no, it, it was, it was tragic, you know. Tragic it was death, a yeah. police that, um, a police that, a police, he was killed by a police officer. Okay, yeah. Yeah, a police officer shot him. Uh, was he black? Uh, nah, he mm -hmm. was, uh, yeah, he was like, I don't want to really get into who he was and stuff yeah. like that, just out of respect for the family. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so at that age, at the age of 15, you know, that's the first time we get exposed to, uh, got exposed to someone dying, someone that I knew, someone that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And then it's just been a downward spiral since then. So, you know, people dying year in, year out, every few months. Um, Wait, so before 15, was that like, was that normal? So the before 15, dropped? yeah, you'd hear about people getting shot, getting, getting shot or someone dying and stuff like that. Yeah. But 15 was the age when someone who I knew died, you know, yeah. someone who I actually grew up with died and stuff like that. And then ever since then, you know, sadly, a lot of brothers passed away and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on them. And, uh, you know, it's been tragic and been unfortunate. Uh, but like I said, it's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're, we'll be accepting of it. Um, one, subhanAllah, one, one story, uh, I remember I was like maybe, I think 20, 21. I was working security. I was yeah. working night shift. And I came home, I was working like 11 to 7, came home, um, you know, got changed, went to bed, mm -hmm. right? So, subhanAllah, that day, um, I woke up to the gunshots that killed, that some, killed someone I knew. Mm -hmm. So, that day, I woke up to the gunshots um, that killed uh, someone that I knew right in front of my house, yeah. subhanAllah. So, uh, I, I heard these, like, l loud bangs, and then there was, like, a rental store, uh, like a car rental um, uh, building right behind my house and they had like this metal door so I thought someone was banging on that door wow. sometimes when they're trying to get in they're trying to return the car or whatever they're, they're, I thought someone was banging on that metal door so I look out my window and there was no one there so that was at the back of the house and then I ran to the like front of the house I was on the third floor and then I just saw a whole commotion and stuff like that and people running out of the house and you know whatnot. and then subhanAllah found out later that um uh, someone that, you know, we also knew was a couple of years younger than me. Yeah. Also, you know, uh, Allah Rahman, he got shot and he died there, like right in front of our house. So, um, yeah, it's Akhi, it's, it's, it's Regent Park. Akhi, if you speak to anyone, it's, I'm not, uh, you know, no one special from there. If you speak to anyone from there, it's going to be the same story, you know, since we stories of uh, tragedy, stories of like uh, death and, and people either dying or people being like, you know, uh, paralyzed due to, you know, violence and stuff like that and drugs and people dying due to um, overdosing and stuff like that, getting into drugs and stuff. Um, I could confidently say I could that I could name um, probably 30 people that either I know, I grew up with, whereas my friend, maybe an acquaintance, a peer, a year older, a year younger, that, you know, they're no longer alive. SubhanAllah. Yeah. As, what does that do to you as a person? Does that desensitize you, or how do you kind of feel? D does it ever get easy? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, d do you ever go through life like feeling any different about it? Does it you know what I'm saying? Yeah, hundred percent, Akhi. Um, you definitely get desensitized to death, and when you know people who are involved in that life, I'm not gonna lie. It's as crazy as it sounds. You put people in a box mentally, like. You put people, people in a box uh, and you tell yourself that that box that you put them in is the box of people who, if you get that phone call about them or regarding them that they got killed or they got shot, like you're not going to be shocked or surprised. Oh, wow. That, yeah, yeah. So like that's, that's you know, uh, obviously it's not something good, but literally you get to the point where if you get that call about so-and-so that something happened to him, 
you, you know, it's just, you sort it's, of expect that message yeah. essentially. Not expect it, but you're not going to be shocked at all. Yeah. You're just going to be like, you know, obviously condolences. May Allah have mercy for him on him, and just go on with your day. Yeah, you know? and that's like a strike contrast contrast between like here in Australia because it's obviously like we've got our housing commissions and our flats and all that kind of stuff and. The thing is, the difference is people sort of like put on the act there about that life and whatnot, when in reality it's like it's not true. And you yeah. got that contrast between over there in Toronto where it's like it's an actual real life occurrence. You know, it's happening on, I guess, on a monthly basis or whatnot. You know, subhanAllah. And obviously we don't condone that either. Yeah, of course you know? we don't condone it. And a lot of times too, um, something that people don't really uh, speak about is um, sometimes uh, these guys who get into these things get into that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, uh, like we said, like you said, we're not condoning it, but sometimes it's like their hand is forced yep. because something happens, mm-hmm. right, to them or someone in their family or someone in their area, yep. and then now they're you know quote unquote forced to make a decision yep. about whether they're gonna you know defend themselves or not. Like I said, of course, we don't want to condone violence and stuff like that. Yeah. But at the same time, too, for a lot of these guys, um, uh, they didn't have like another option when it comes to dealing with these things that happen to them and the people around them. Yeah. So sadly, they turn towards violence and turn towards, uh, you know, uh, things like that. What has what what that taught you, though, being in, in amongst that, like, sort of, that environment, you know what I mean? Well, it makes you very tough. Yeah. From a young age, you know, being around people. Y- you know, when you're 14, 15, you start to see the guys who start to sell drugs. They jump on their bike, you know, they got their little bike, they're run, riding around uh, in the area. And you know what's going on. Like, if you see a guy on a bike... In the area, you know what he's doing, you know? And sometimes you see guys that are your age, a year older, a year younger, whatever. And you just kind of, like, go with the flow. You know, you do your thing. You stay out of trouble. You try your best to, you know, be cool with everyone. Um, because in Regent Park, we have, like, this uh, really special um, uh, family vibe that we have, uh, you know, in the area where, like, people who are practicing, people who are religious, people who are not religious, people who are caught up in the game, people caught up in different things. Like, we all have a good relationship with one another. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't advise one another and we don't, you know, try to uh, help people. But it's just, you know, we have um, this thing where we kind of all grew up together and everyone chose their path in life. And uh, at the end of the day, we're brothers mm-hmm. and we have to be there for one another through the th- through the thick and the thin, through the good and th- through the good and the bad. Um, and uh, just try to always be like that, you know, that voice of reason for some brothers and, and try to remind them and, and be there for them. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, that's different compared to other areas in Toronto, which I've heard of, uh, you know, people speaking about the disconnect between the people who are practicing and the people who are not practicing. Mm. Where, like, the people who are practicing, people who are not practicing, they can't sit down and have a convo. They can't sit down and do something fun together or, or really connect. But in Regent Park, it's like it's love till this day. Mm. You know, people who are, like, you know, really into the dean and stuff and people who are not really into the dean, um, you can hang around with them. You can be around them, and 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 people know. You know, people can read the room, and they understand when it's appropriate to do certain things and when it's not, and to respect people who you know um, are on their dean and stuff like that. Is it majority populated by Muslims, Regent Park? Because it so kind of sounds like it. Yeah, and now it rec- it got gentrified a couple of years ago, uh, okay. so the whole dynamic of uh, the the area ch- has changed. As usual. As usual. Yeah, as usual. <laughs> well, Newport used to be all of those. There's no one there anymore. But. Yeah, but growing up, there, w- yeah, there was a lot of Muslims. Yeah. And being a Muslim was totally norm- normal in the area. Mm. Being a Muslim was totally normal. normal. Uh, excuse me. And, uh, you know, like I said, there was a lot of masajid, a lot of programs, a lot of things geared towards Muslims and stuff like that. Even the non-Muslims in the area, they respected Muslims and, you know, respected, they respected the needs of uh, the Muslim children, whether it was halal food or, you know, um, giving them time to pray during different occasions and stuff like that it was a it was a pretty friendly muslim environment you know to be honest with you see this is the thing for me yeah um whenever i hear about you know like people who are kind of like had their hand forced to get into something like uh gang violence and all that sort of stuff you know we can't i don't think we can relate here in melbourne you know so like what's it like for somebody who doesn't go with the flow. Does that make sense? Like mm. you, I don't know if you were because I wasn't here. I don't know if yeah, you yeah, had yeah. already discussed that. What's it like not being a part of the wave? Does that make sense? Um. So personally, I, I was never um, invited to that lifestyle. You know, so the, the way it works is generally speaking, you know, uh, you're gonna get a young person who's gonna get influenced or introduced to that lifestyle, whether it's like first selling drugs and stuff like that. 
and then maybe uh, you know other things after that gang, gang violence and stuff like that they're going to get introduced to it or like i said a situation might present itself where now this person makes a decision and thrusts themselves into whatever it is they know mm-hmm. the, the that lifestyle um, but alhamdulillah, you know, I wasn't really, I've ne- I was never introduced to it by a person or, you know, told, you know, do this for me or do that for me. Because that's how it us- usually starts. Yeah. Older heads to- tells a young guy, yo, hold this for me. Yeah. You know, do the And the kid, sometimes he's just thinking, all right, I'm going to hold it. You know, doesn't really realize, like, the severity of what they're getting themselves into. They're told, okay, do this, hold this, I'm going to come back for this. Take this over there. There's someone there, he's going to pick it up. Next thing you know, he does a couple of times. Next thing he, can f- he finds out that this guy gives him $100, $200. Right, he's never seen that type of money in his life, mm. uh, and then next thing you know, he's thinking, "Yo, I could do this for myself and stuff like that." And then the rest is history. It starts the cycle. Yeah, it starts the cycle and stuff. And then when the violence begins, that's where it becomes uh, becomes dangerous. You know, where now you have to carry a gun and you have to, uh, you know, uh, protect yourself. Um, and and that's what I was trying to say earlier. Like a lot of these, some guys they may have uh, might carry a gun. And honestly, they're carrying that gun for, uh, you know, to protect themselves mm-hmm. and, and to defend themselves if, if something does occur or something doesn't ha- does happen. Uh, it's not always like what people think that if you have a gun, you're going shooting, killing people and stuff like that. Yeah. Like I said, situations happen and people have to make decisions about how they're going to handle that situation. And some of the decisions that they make is them, you know, picking up a weapon and or carrying a weapon with them at all times. And then if something does happen, they're forced to, you know, bust their gun or shoot or whatever. And then from there, mm-hmm. you know. You know how it goes. Yeah, does 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 that stigma sort of still exist in the area that you're from, in like region and all that? Because I've seen like like guys like Yasin who started his project with like Shoot for Peace, like mm. teaching kids like photography, or like implementing or trying to like get him into a different type of hobby other than the streets. Yeah, um, as a way of trying to get him out of that life. You know, mm. and I just wanted to know like, is that stigma still sort of exists over there? Yeah, it still exists. Still, still, still uh, exists in Region Park and. Uh, um, it's still happening, you know. The young generation, some of them are still picking up, picking up on it, and moving forward with that um, that lifestyle. Uh, sadly, but like you said, Mashallah Yasin and other brothers, other people in the community have done a lot of work, um, a lot of things, a lot of initiatives to kind of steer the you know the youth away from those things and give them other options, um, you know, in their lives. Yeah, because with any community, that's what you sort of need, you know. Options. You need like yeah, options and role models, people like <laughs> that they can look up to and then that they can relate to, you know. And obviously Islam being like a massive part of your identity, you know, it all goes back into like, sorry, not boxing yourself into that, you know, just because you're, you're Muslim, it doesn't mean that everything is haram for mm. you, you know, like you can enjoy the parts of life and then also practice your religion at the same time, you know. Um, but I want to know, like you mentioned, um, it's called Sheikh Bukhari as well, being a massive role model um, in Toronto or mm-hmm. in Region Park specifically. How much of an influence was um, Sheikh Bukhari to you? So after uh, my parents, yeah. you know, after my mom and dad, he's been the biggest influence in my life. And I think uh, it's safe to say that um, the other guys from Regent Park would have the same exact answer. You know, they'd probably say the same thing, that after their parents, he probably has had the biggest influence on them in their life. And these guys, some of these guys, they're not even students of knowledge or, you know, sheikhs themselves or whatever it may be. Um, someone might be like, that's an easy answer for you or it's an easy thing for you to say because you're in da'wah and you're an imam now and stuff like that. But I'm talking about people who have different types of uh, paths that they've taken in life yeah. right now. They all, I think all, all of them will confidently say that Sheikh Bukhari played a big role, if yeah. not the biggest role after their parents in their lives. Because Sheikh Bukhari, he was the imam at the masjid. Um, he was an unofficial imam meaning he would lead the prayers and stuff like that. He wasn't getting paid or anything like that. He yeah. would work his uh, regular job. And uh, he would always be there for the community, leading the prayers, um, being available to the community, being available to the youth, right? And uh, this is one thing I was telling you about last night. Um, when I look back you know, at our community and look at now, alhamdulillah, the different brothers who are doing amazing things, um, the one thing that I see that we all go back to or the, one, the link between all of us is Sheikh Bukhari a lot of times. Because he was there to advise us. He would always encourage everyone in whatever they were good at. He wasn't there just trying to make everyone into a sheikh or make everyone into his successor and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, and this is the, the true way of, of, of the scholars and stuff like that, which is that they encourage people uh, regarding what those people do well. 
So if they see someone, mashallah, if they're doing something good, even if it doesn't have to be like something that's religious or whatever, it could be a dunya matter. But if they see that this person is excelling in it, and as long as it's something that is permissible, they actually they'll actually encourage that person, as opposed to some people have this attitude where they see someone who's maybe excelling in a dunya related matter. And they think that, no, I need to steer him away from that and steer him to the deen and to become a sheikh and a talib and stuff like that, a suit of knowledge. But that, that, that isn't, you know, the, 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 the true way of, of someone who has knowledge and, and wisdom and stuff like that. You want to get Muslims to be the best, uh, you know, whatever they do, while also having that Muslim identity, having that, you know, the, 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 having Islam to be the thing that they go back to and the thing that they find uh, peace in and the thing that they, um, you know, they work from. Right, so Sheikh Bukhari, Wallahi, man, Subhanallah. There's so many stories, man. Yeah, he would sit there after Fajr with us, sit there after Isha. He used to teach us classes, give us classes, teach us books and stuff like that. Stuff that maybe now brothers who are students of knowledge are just getting around to finding out about, you know, whether it's books or classes and stuff like that. Yeah. When we were 17, 18, from a young age, he was teaching us. And and the thing about Sheikh Bukhari was that he was fluent in he's Somali, of course. So he's fluent in Somali. Yeah. He's fluent in Arabic, of course, and he was fluent in English. So there was no gap or barrier between us and him. He would do the Friday khutbahs in English. He would give us classes in English, give us give us classes in English and stuff like that. And you know that made a big difference on uh, on the community. And 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 he is so respected and loved by the people in Toronto. If you say Sheikh Bukhari's name, like it rings bells in Toronto. Yeah. He's not world famous. He's not on YouTube. He's not yeah. you know out here on social media and stuff like that. But you know he's just like he has a true respect. From the community and stuff like that, you know. Mm. Um, Would you say it's due to like, because obviously, like anywhere that you go in regards to Muslim communities around the world, there's like a sort of a disconnect from the community, um, not not specific communities, but like the communities and their local imam. You know what I mean? Mm. Do you think it's due to was it like the emotional intelligence that Sheikh Bukhari had, and was there like a certain moment that like struck you? Like maybe in the moment it didn't, but later on you go, hey, yo, like I remember what Sheikh Bukhari said, you know. Yeah, subhanAllah, um, with him it was like, you could tell that what he was doing, like I said, although he wasn't getting paid, but you could tell it wasn't a chore for him. Mm. It wasn't like, all right, I'm, I'm going to come in, I'm about to leave this fajr, I'm about to recite nicely, everyone's going to be happy, and I'm about to dip out. Yeah. Or I'm going to come in for Aisha, lead prayer, and go home. No, he enjoyed it. And he cherished, you know, our relationships with him. He cherished, you know, having young people, the next generation right in front of him, at his feet. He cherished it and he took advantage of it and uh, he saw it to be, you know, something of great value. And he didn't look at it as a chore, uh, as something that, you know, these kids are bothering me or they always come and ask me questions and stuff like that. He, he viewed it as something special and an opportunity to, you know, really uh, uh, plant the seeds for the, the future of the community and, and the future of, uh, you know, the Muslim Ummah also. So I think that's the thing that stood out with Shabu Hadi, man, that it was something that... Uh, he was a student of knowledge. And until this day, he is, for me, the, the definition of a true talib al a true student of knowledge. Because even though he's, much, he's a bit older now, he's still studying daily. Even when I was growing up, when he was teaching us, it wasn't something like, I'm the imam now, I'm the sheikh, I know everything, I just come teach classes, and that's it. No, you would see him in the library reading, studying, memorizing. Yep. You know, um, I would go to him. And, and, and study with him and read to him and, and, and ask him questions and stuff like that. And I'd come walking on him and he's reviewing his Quran, he's reviewing his books and stuff like that. So till this day, you know, even in, in recent times he's still teaching and still studying, he is like, he's like, he's goals when it comes to being a student of knowledge. Because being a student of knowledge is a lifestyle, it's a mindset. It's not something where you go and graduate from a school after four years and then you become an imam and now you just focus on making money. It's, it's something that you dedicate your life to. And, and that's something that we all saw with Sheikh Bukhari. He would constantly be studying and constantly be teaching, mm. you know. And I remember one day, subhanAllah, one thing that hit me with Sheikh Bukhari, and it, it, it got me confused. And, and at first, I didn't really understand what he was saying. But later on, I understood what he meant. Uh, he was asked a question one time. Uh, and it was just like, we had a class after Fajr. And then after the class, the, the general class, we would come up to him. And we spent so much time with him just asking him questions. And he was cool. He used to play basketball growing up in Somalia, I think. Yeah. He was a part of, like, the local team and stuff like that. <laughs> they uh, all say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, I remember one time we were at the gym and uh, we were just with the youth and stuff like that. We had, like, a, a program for the Muslim youth. And then he'd come sometimes. He'd shoot a couple of times. Yeah. But he had, like, that, you know, that back home type of form. He's shooting it from oh. behind his head and stuff like that. <laughs> Two Jay hands and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> his J was weak, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he used to play and whatnot. Um, I remember one time, uh, you know, someone asked him a question. 
and he he answered the question, and a part of the answer was uh, he said, you know, um, he was saying that that's for like the scholars, like he was discussing the issue, and he said, but that's something um, that is left for the scholars. He said, as for us as like students of knowledge, um, then that's not something that we're gonna delve into. Mm. So I'm like, what's this guy talking about us yeah. as students of knowledge? Yeah. I'm like, did he just? mention me and him and the other my friends in the same sentence yeah. like what do you mean us as like i didn't understand that at first and later on i understood that subhanallah like you know he was so humble and he actually he just he viewed us and him you know as the same we're all students of knowledge we might be at different levels he may be teaching us but we're all like a tulab people who are seeking and and out here trying to learn and stuff like that so that that one hit me man like because nowadays with <laughs> uh, with the uh, sheikhs and sometimes the uh, imams so yeah. they make it very clear where the lines yeah, are yeah, 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 they yeah, make yeah. it very clear habibi yeah. <laughs> you know they make it very clear that you know and 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 um uh, it's, it was something special with sheikh bukhari you know yeah. uh, and, and that's something that honestly it it, it motivates like a, a up and coming student of knowledge like yeah. you know like you know uh, giving them that that motivation and giving them that like that hope that you know yeah. we're the same man just just Put him a little more work, inshallah. What, you get what, there. Do, what do they call it? They call it um, celebrity imams. That's what it is. Like the the new wave of um, yeah, like your your Twitter da'is and all that. Like they've understood the subtitles in Arabic, and all of a sudden they're giving like fatwas and stuff. Yeah, but that's that's the new wave. Yeah. <laughs> so, just for reference for people who like myself don't know who Sheikh Bukhari is. Mm. So can you give us like a little quick brief rundown? What's the age gap between you and him? What's the um? What, what's his ethnicity? I'm guessing it's Somali yeah. now that I know about okay. his form in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get over there. Yeah, bro. So, so Sheikh Bukhari, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala preserve him and keep him safe, <laughs> and reward him for everything he's done for me and everyone else in Regent Park. Um, he's from Somalia. Uh, maybe I might not mention the age gap, but he's like, uh, <laughs> he's a uh, you know like a uh, yeah. probably our, our dad's age and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. definitely, and. Um, he grew up in Somalia, and that's where he first started learning about uh, de- the deen and stuff like that. Learn Arabic, memorize the Quran, probably memorize it when he was like 12 or so. Being in Somalia, you know, you memorize the Quran at a very young age. <laughs> and um, and then he uh, he learned English. You know, he learned English. He was fluent in English in Somalia before leaving. And he had an English school, actually, in, in, in Somalia. And then from there, he traveled to Italy. He was in Italy for about two years before coming to Canada. Mm. And then he came to Canada and... Uh, um, mashallah, you know, he got married and uh, he has a, a son and a daughter. Uh, hopefully that's okay to mention. Sheikh <laughs> 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 Um And subhanAllah, actually, uh, uh, just uh, about, um, I'd say, I think it's been two years now. Yeah, two years or so, maybe three years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, his wife passed away. Allah his wife Allah passed away. Uh, Allah irhamma, she got passed away in, in Egypt. Um, you know, it was a sad little... Uh, uh, she had like a little procedure and you know, Qadr Allah, she passed away. So Sheikh Bukhari, he, you know, he's been with his kids now. Um, uh, you know, he's been traveling a bit. Um, but he was, he's, he, he's been in the uh, in the Regent Park community um, for as long as anyone can remember. He's been there, been leading the prayers and stuff like that. And like I said, he first started learning Deen in, in Somalia, but he continued to study even when he came to Canada. He continued to learn, continued to study from time to time. Of course, he would... Uh, you know, uh, meet the ulama and the scholars of Islam and be in contact with them. And uh, um, he was always teaching us, you know, he used to teach Quran. He used to be like Somali, Duxi Ma'alan, he used to yeah. teach Saturday and Sundays. And uh, I first started memorizing Quran with him. And I memorized my Quran with him. And uh, that's a whole other story. But uh, subhanAllah, like I've read the, uh, the Quran to him and I started when I was 17. And I finished around uh, 23, 24. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, Akhi, I've never given him a single penny for... Uh, you know, teaching me Quran or, or, or like the time that, you know, uh, wow. he dedicated towards uh, towards me. He never asked for it. He would never take it. Everyone, one thing everyone knows about Sheikh Bukhari, and this is like, inshallah, it seems like it's the secret behind behind him. Um, it's like, you know, mashallah, Allah Hasiba Allah knows his reality and yeah. we can't uh, say, anything, uh, say anything about anyone in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but just the sincerity, you know, yeah. just the sincerity and, and, just the sincerity behind uh, willing to help Muslims, being so helpful, whether it's teaching people, whether it's um, doing ruqya, you know, um, you know, uh, reciting Quran on people, 
and uh, trying to heal them through the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just time. I've, I've recited, I've recited to, Quran, to Quran to him in so many different places at the masjid, yeah. walking with him while he's grocery shopping. Yeah. You know? Because <laughs> yeah. he's, uh, he, like I said, it's Quran, mashallah. He is, it's yeah. just, you'll read anywhere, anytime, bismillah. He's, he's doing a shopping, buying his fruits and vegetables and stuff, and he's listening to me read and correcting me and stuff like that. You know, like a proper uh, Somali, uh, yeah. Somali Quran teacher. You know what Sheikh Abdullah Bihi calls it? Mm. He calls it uh, tape recorders. <laughs> yeah, mashallah, it's just, it's just like that, you know? So, uh, you know, he's, he's, he, and this, is, this isn't just for me. Like, mm. like I, I want to reiterate the fact that, you know, people may see me now doing da'wah and being involved and in being an imam and stuff like that. But Sheikh Bukhari has had the same impact. Yep. Obviously, a bit more with me because I kind of followed it in his path. Yep. But he's had, you know, a very similar impact on these other brothers from our community who are now doing different things. You know, like you said, he has seen shoot for peace and stuff like that. Yeah. People who are, you know, involved in other things and other paths and stuff like that. They all will will speak very highly of Sheikh Bukhari and the impact he had on them in their lives and the confidence he instilled in them uh, to be good Muslims and to be the best at you know whatever we do. Uh, it's been something amazing. Yeah, you said before as well. Um, other than um, Sheikh Bukhari, you said your parents as well. They had a massive impact in your life. Hundred percent. You want to delve into that? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Especially um, my mom, Jazallah Khairan. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reward her and keep her safe. She's been like you know my best, uh, my best supporter, mm-hmm. my biggest critic. Um, you know the cliche stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, it's mums. You can say everything. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, nah, mashallah. Like just from like raising us since we were young, keeping us safe, trying our best to. Um, <coughs> keep us safe in the environment that we were in growing up in Regent Park and uh, just literally um you know you know doing her best and and and, and trying her best to uh keep us on the right path and putting all of her time and effort and uh blood sweat and tears into her children and and being there for them you know may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her on behalf of me and on behalf of my siblings uh you know and especially when I wanted to go out and seek knowledge and stuff like that the first time I traveled Back in uh, 2012 and 2013, I was like maybe uh, 20 or 19, 20-ish. I didn't have much money, if yeah. anything, but she was the one who like you know took care of me and, and sent me what I needed and stuff like that when I traveled to Saudi and to Egypt and to Kuwait and stuff like that. Um, so uh, she's been very supportive. She's been very happy of the path that I took, mm-hmm. um, and you know uh, it's been very humbling. You know, having someone in your corner like that, um, yeah. such as a mom, especially with my mom, um, you know. Uh, you know, keep her safe. Uh, she, she's like, she's always led by example. Um, she didn't just talk the talk, especially when it came to the dean. She would walk, she walked the walk. And that's something I think we can, uh, I think something that's common with a lot of our parents who grew up maybe back home or came, uh, you know, uh, as immigrants and stuff like that. You could see like the Islam in, in, in their lifestyle, you know, when it comes to their prayers and stuff like that. With what, it doesn't matter whatever was going on in their life, there's certain things that were uh, constants and things that never changed such as their dedication to their prayers, Fajr and Aisha and everything in between, and just constantly uh, trying their best to, to be there for their children and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think that's one thing that we take for granted when it comes to looking at our parents. Mm-hmm. We may have more, quote-unquote, n- information than them. We may, n- may, we may know more about things being authentic, things being correct, but, like, we do more talking than walking yeah. in comparison to our parents when they've been dedicated to what they've been doing and their practice of Islam for 50, 60 years or so. So, um, and and I think um, just with our parents' generation, it's like the concept of ibadah, worship, and just being dedicated to Monday and Thursday fasting, being dedicated to Qiyam al-Layl, waking up before Fajr. Like, that's something that they didn't take for granted. That's something that they really focus on, as opposed to us, we're kind of like more focused on knowing whether you can or can't do something yeah. and even if we find out that you can do it yeah. <laughs> ain't nobody trying to do it yeah. you know what i mean asaf, sadly you know uh, you know it's not something to laugh about but it's the sad truth you know you find out that this is the sunnah so now when you find out that this is a sunnah the first thing you're thinking is that now i can tell people that this is a sunnah as opposed to our parents oh. generation it's like they found out this is sunnah the prophet did it yeah. so Allah so I need to do this. I'm trying to do this. Now, if I tell people that this is the sunnah after that, then that's khair upon khair. You know, that's good yeah. on good. But I need to do it. As opposed to us, we're thinking, oh, I found the sunnah. All right, I'm going to see. I'm going to catch this guy slipping next time. Yeah. I'm going to tell him this is sunnah or this <laughs> yeah. is whatever it may be, you know. Yeah. Sadly, I feel like that's that's a mentality that's crept into us. And I feel like shaitan has played a big role on that. Um, when, you know, sadly, we're supposed to internalize the things that we learn first and foremost. 
implement them. And then if the option and the opportunity for da'wah arises later on, then alhamdulillah. And if it doesn't, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to force it and, 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 and you know, force, force it to, to, to happen or whatever, you know? Yeah. So true, because last time, like, I remember I was listening to a lecture when I was going for a walk or whatever it was. And I remember hearing a sheikh saying something, and I'm like, fuck, I can't wait to drop down the podcast. I was like, <laughs> oh, wait a second, no, I can't do that. And I remember even telling Ashraf once, like, whenever you have the intention to, for example, like, you want to lose weight or whatever it is, you remember I was like to you, I'd, re- I'd rather not tell people about it until I've actually implemented it. Otherwise, I get caught up in the whole, you know, like, oh, I've already felt like I've done it. So it's like with that, with the sunnahs, like, it's like if I've already told somebody about it, they assume I've done the sunnah, yeah. so it's like that's it's not the same, you know. Mm-hmm. And it kind of takes me back to like intentions and actually thinking or feeling you're doing something or feeling like, like for example, you're mourning athkar, yeah. You're like, oh, I have the feeling to do it. I haven't done it. I haven't actually mm. opened a page of I don't know fortress Muslims, <laughs> looked yeah. at the the morning athkar and gone okay, yeah, line by line. I read it every single morning and then. What I did was I felt like I wanted to do it and then I had the motivation to do it and then let's see, I didn't do anything about it. Mm. Like, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of actually implementing rather than just having a feeling or a motivation to do something? You know, subhanAllah, akhi, it's like you see uh, many people from our generation, you know, they fall on and off of the deen. You know, we talk about oh, he fell off, or this brother, she's off, the, she's off the dean, the sister's off the dean, or he fell off, he's gonna come back, whatever. And you don't really see that with like the older generation, right? Someone could be like, well, they're older, you know, they know more and they've seen life and they understand the the seriousness of life. But at the same time, I feel like a big part of it is that they've built themselves when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to worship, uh, worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They've built themselves, they've put in the time and the effort reading Quran praying their prayers on time, you know, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, doing all these these all of these things where now um, they're, this ibadah that they've, they've been doing is going to protect themselves. It's going to protect them from, you know, the ups and downs that they go through, the different emotions that they face on a daily basis uh, in life, as opposed to us where we fill our heads with, you know, all the right answers, mm-hmm. right? But one thing comes our way, one we get one whiff of a desire or of a doubt or something, and all of a sudden it's like, where did all that end go? Where did all the information yeah. go? You know, all those verses you've memorized, all the hadiths that you can quote and stuff like that. It's because we haven't, like, protected ourselves. We haven't made that barrier or that, that we haven't built that fortress mm. for ourselves through the ibadah, through the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for our parents' generation, I feel like they've, you know, they've solidified that, that fortress around them and that protection through the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, uh, you know, that's why you see them, although they may go right and left sometimes, generally speaking, they're gonna stay in the middle, as opposed to you know, the younger generation, where the younger generation where you see guys going from left to right, you know, in the same day. Yeah. You know, the guy, mashallah, he slaps on the kameez, and he, you know, he's yeah. at the masjid, <laughs> but nighttime, Allahu Alam, <laughs> what, what's going on and yeah. stuff like that. You know. Yeah. So I feel like ibadah does protect a person. You know, having that connection with with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. What do you think is like the biggest reason for that? Like for our generation to become like this. Motivation merchants, like I was saying in the Sheikh Sajid episode, we've, you know, all we do is we pop on a lecture, put our headphones on, and that's it. We feel like we just drive by Dean, you know, mm-hmm. everything is just all fine and dandy. After I listen to a lecture, like, all right, bet Allah SWT is not gonna look at us and go, oh, you listen to normal, it can't go work. Mm-hmm. But did you pray Sunnah? Did you mm-hmm. did you actually sell your for sell your faraid on mm-hmm. time? Did you, you know, did you read the Qur'an? Did you implement it? Not just understanding the virtues of reading the Qur'an. Beyond that, it's kind of like, did you actually implement that? What do you think our problem is as, like, this generation? I don't know if you're included because you, you seem to hide your age. <laughs> 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 no, we're all in the same generation. <laughs> um, but, well, I, there's a lot of things, you know, I, I can't narrow them down. But I feel like a big part of it is um, the fact that I think we the way we understand deen or the, the Islam, uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, we're we not following the right steps in how we uh, internalize the deen and practice the deen in the sense that like you're supposed to learn and you're supposed to take the deen for yourself first and foremost. Protect yourselves and your families. You're supposed, the number one priority for you is yourself. 
you know, as a Muslim, the number one priority is yourself. Yeah. And then after that comes your family. And then after that comes whoever is related to you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have to remember that Habibi, you know, we are our number one priority. So meaning when I learn, I have to learn for myself. When I practice, I have to practice for myself. When I stay away from haram, I have to stay away for my own so for my own sake. Of course, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to protect yourself from the hellfire, right? As opposed to learning and studying and, you know, learning about the deen and getting into the deen for the sake of other people. You know what I mean? In the sense that a lot of times, like I was talking about earlier, people are learning the deen or studying things for the sake of correcting others. Mm -hmm. Or for the sake of being like this warrior or this champion who's going to come and save people, yeah. you know, from the hellfire or from bid'ah or whatever it may be, Right. Uh, and doing that is a good thing, but it's a Habibi, you haven't developed yourself. You, you're not at that level yet. You know, you're jumping the gun. You know, you're supposed to develop yourself. How can you lead people if you can't lead yourself? Mm. Right? How can you be there to guide people if you yourself haven't internalized that guidance? If that guidance is just something that is on your tongue that you know you're you're, you're you know you're sharing with other people, but it hasn't touched your own heart. Mm. Right? So. A lot of times when it comes to uh, the deen, and a, a lot of this has to do with ilm, has to do with knowledge, like we just we want to jump in the microwave. We want things to move so fast. And we don't understand that, you know, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with them, um, the Prophet Sallallahu he gradually developed his companions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gradually developed the companions and the li their lifestyle, right? At first, you know, they were told not to, uh, they were told that drinking had benefit in it, but there was more harm than good in drinking. That's yeah. the first thing. Okay, now I understand that you know, drinking is not the best thing. There's some benefit to it, but it's actually more harmful than good. Uh, then they found out that, Ya ladina amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. You can't come to prayer while you're drunk. So I can't drink during the day, because if I drink after one prayer, I'm going to be drunk for the next prayer. Yeah. I can only drink at nighttime after Isha. Tayyib. Now I'm going to, I know that drinking is not the best thing, and I can only drink during a specific time. Then the last verse comes down. That, um, you know, refrain from khamr, from drinking alcohol and these other things yeah. that are haram for you to be successful. Now they're only, they, they understand that it's something wrong. They, they're only doing it in a specific time. That's why, you know, they said, as the narration say that when the final verse came down prohibiting uh, alcohol, that the streets of Medina were flowing with wine and alcohol, right? Because they were, they were ready for it. Their, their hearts were ready to accept all of this that, that was coming towards them. And likewise, we have to understand that this is, you know, it's a cliche, but uh, Islam is a marathon. It's not a race, mm -hmm. right? Everyone wants to be Usain Bolt, that 100-meter yeah. dash and stuff like that. But yeah. we got to be more like, you know, whoever is Mo the... Farah. Mo Farah. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> shout out Mo Farah. <laughs> right? That, that long-distance runner, right? It's a marathon. It, it, you got to give yourself time. To yeah. learn and, and, and even more so with and because a lot of times we learn one thing and then five down five years down the road we find out that that's not even right or it's not exactly how we thought it was or uh, we find out that we were wrong and for five years you're spreading and telling people no no you can't do this or you can't do that or you have to do this you have to do that and then five years down the road down, down the road all you have is regret mm -hmm. you just regret why, why did I even speak man yeah and subhanallah you realize the more you learn like the more you learn the more you realize that you know you don't know much. Yeah, especially when people who start to actually study fiqh the proper way, you know, as opposed to learning about learning about fiqh through sound bites, that oh this hadith says this so that's the ruling this hadith says that so this is the ruling you know as a, you know compared to actually learning fiqh through like a, a, a madhab through a school of thought yeah. an understanding that has been refined and uh, you know refurbished and looked after and reviewed through you know years and years of, of scholarly um, uh, scholarly studies and stuff like that. And then you realize, like, whoa, like, you know, in the beginning, you start to think, like, you know, you got this whole phenomenon of, uh, oh, I'll just look at the hadith and I'll just understand the hadith directly, as opposed to, you know, looking at the scholars and seeing what the scholars said about the hadith, mm -hmm. right? So I feel like a big issue is, like, we try to do too much too fast. Back to getting back to the question. We try to do too much too fast, and it's unnecessary. We put ourselves in, like, dahiyah, you know, like, you put yourself in a, in a bad predicament. You're doing too much, Habibi. Mm -hmm. Just chill out, pray your salah. <coughs> work on your akhlaq, work on your relationship with your parents, learn a little bit as you can, uh, learn as much as you can, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in the masjid, learn whatever you can at home, study bit by bit, build yourself. If you want to choose the path of seeking knowledge and being in a sunnah knowledge, then there's a specific way, 
the specific regiment that you have to you have to uh, uh, uphold and take. And if you just want to be, you know, regular, you know, and I don't mean that mean that in a bad way, but it's like a, a practicing Muslim who understands their deen, respects Allah subhanahu wa taala, respects their deen, uh, then that's completely fine. And uh, you know, just just take it easy, you know, because a lot of times, like I said, people uh, get filled with regret down the road when they realize that yo. Honestly, I spent 10 years wasting my time. I spent 10 years running around doing a whole bunch of nothing. And, you know, I have nothing to show for it. Mm. You know, there was, um, the funniest thing is, like, there's a Bruce Lee quote. Uh, I hate to bring it back mm. to, like, non-Muslim, like, <laughs> rhetoric. But, like, there's a Bruce Lee quote where he says, um, there's nothing different between the beginner and the expert. You know, like, the person who's the master. The beginner and the master are similar because everything is simple, yeah? They simplify everything. But the person in between who's on his way to becoming a master complicates everything. Mm. So that's why he's in a, in, in a weird state. And it's something where I look at, for example, like, I don't want to use his name because it might be bad because I don't, this isn't a negative thing. Yeah, like, yeah. for example, Muhammad Hoblos, yeah? Mm. I don't know, you know, if you yeah, know, like his lectures are very, like, precise and to the point. And he's telling you the basics of what you should and shouldn't be doing. Mm. Like, it, it's very, like, it's very simplistic and it's perfect for his audience where he's talking about specific things about the deen and it's like, be a good person, you know, have good character, you know, like pray on time, do this sort of stuff. And it, and you have those reminders consistently and you're like, you, you look at the basics and you're like, oh, wow, okay. I kind of understand where it's coming from now. And then I, I started to get from when I started, the, uh, like when I started like getting religious and then I became like in the, in the intermediary level not a master at all, but I kind of went back to beginner. <laughs> but <laughs> when I was in the intermediary level, I started to notice that I complicated everything. I was watching Dawa Man and Ali Dawa on the on the streets, yeah. uh, going back and forth with atheists, and and I'm like, oh yeah, and then like this is how God exists, and you're losing your mind. You're like, hang on, wait, all this stuff. I'm up until two thirty a.m. I miss Fajr. Mm. You know what I mean? And and now everything's become complicated. Everything is so like. It's not really like the deen is easy when mm. you think about it, yeah. Like, that's isn't that like what yeah. the deen like the, the deen be. is made easier mm. upon us, you know? Yeah. Like, what what do you suggest somebody stuck in that loop does? You know, this is for myself. If I'm <laughs> Number one, uh, try to stay off YouTube. <laughs> yeah. yeah, try to stay off YouTube, man. How about the Fading Podcast? Huh? That kind of help. Fair Dinkle podcast, yeah, yeah. Thumbs up. <laughs> 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 the podcast. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. You're right, Akhi, you know, um, subhanAllah. And I, so a brother recently, I, I did um, uh, a lecture at um, that university. Deakin. Deakin University. And a brother, um, he, uh, he, he used to be Shia, and then he accepted Sunni Islam. Or he wasn't Muslim at all, and he was family Shia, then he, he became Muslim. And uh, he was asking me, he said, like, he feels like he got caught up in these things and stuff like that. And I told him, Akhi, um, you got to keep things basic, and you got to stay away from things that, don't bring you benefit. The Prophet also says in the hadith, and he was given the special ability by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say a few words, uh, but those few words would later go on to be explained in volumes of books by scholars. Jawami al Kalim. He was able to say a few sentences, but those sentences were profound in meaning. One of the one of these type of hadith where the Prophet says, Ihris ala be diligent, be eager in regards to what benefits you. Like if you just live a life according to this principle, where you're going to be eager and diligent regarding things that benefit you, wallahi, you're never going to lose. You're always going to be winning, right? Because you're always going to be bettering yourself. You're always going to be, you know, taking yourself to the next level because you're always involved in things that benefit you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to sit down and actually look at what we're doing, what, what consumes our time. Okay, I've been watching this, this guy on YouTube for the last six months. Has my ibadah gotten better? X, no. Have I gotten a better understanding of the deen? Uh, X, no, not really. Um, have I become more, you know, uh, open-minded or more understanding of people and the mistakes that they make? And, you know, my Muslim brothers and sisters, big X, no. Because now you started to, you know, feel, you know, certain feelings towards other people and disliking people who you see at the masjid who may have a different understanding of Islam or a different background and stuff like that. So if all of these are X's, big red X's, mm -hmm. Why am, I, why am I listening to this guy? Or why am I consuming uh, so much of his content? All these debates on online at Speaker's Corner and stuff like that and all of these different things. Like You have to actually have to ask yourself, how, when do I feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Oh yeah, when I used to go to Fajr at the masjid. 
when I used to read my Quran, when I used to go to my Quran class twice a week with my sheikh, right? Those are the things that made me feel better. I was in a better mental state. I was, a better, I was in a better spiritual state uh, when I was doing those simple things, right? Uh, shaitan, he likes to beautify things to us yeah. and he likes to beautify our actions, right? So he makes you do things and he beautifies those things and makes you think that, you know, you're getting ahead, you're doing the right things, you're watching the right content and stuff like that. But in reality, you know, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. Yeah, right? If it ain't broken, don't fix it. So um, it just taking the, the advice of the Prophet you know, be eager and be diligent in what benefits you. And sometimes you have to sit down with yourself and actually write down, you know, and, and, and talk to yourself, you know, as, as funny as that may sound, about, you know, what you're consuming and what you're doing and how your days are passing. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you about the time that you were given and how you used it, right? Time is a big blessing. So um, I think if a person does that, if a person just focuses on, focuses on what benefits them and what makes them feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they just implement that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide them the rest of the way. It goes to back um, in a nutshell, like perfecting the basics. You know what I mean? Like if you're not praying your five days, five daily prayers, and don't go learning like fiqh online basically mm -hmm. and confusing yourself. Because I think that's like a big thing as well. You get worn down and then like your deen starts to become like a chore. You know what I mean? Instead of like a way of life. It's mm -hmm. like it's like it's like a similar contrast is like the podcast type of thing. Like because we come on the podcast and try and not make it work. You know what I mean? Where we schedule our life around it and enjoy it as we go along. Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing with the din. And once it starts to become work, that's when I guess like shaitan starts to get involved in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then after he makes it seem like it's some, like a large mountain to climb. When in reality, it's just something small, you know? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was leading on to something else as well. Um, in regards to, I wanted to switch it up just a little bit, yeah? Yeah. Um, obviously, you're from Toronto, yeah? A big Toronto fan as well. Yes, sir. Recently, a couple of years ago, or just over a couple of years ago, Toronto obviously won the, the championship mm -hmm. over there. What was the atmosphere like over there? I want to know, because obviously you went downtown. So you follow basketball, right? I do follow the NBA. Yeah. We all do, we all okay. do. Yeah. So he's a Phoenix Suns fan, by the way. Since when? Since Steve Nash? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. Or Devin Booker. <laughs> Devin Booker. <laughs> nah, what happened was, I didn't have a team uh, and I didn't want to jump on the Golden State bandwagon because yeah. I had initially started watching what, maybe just after LeBron's era at, um, at uh, in Miami. Miami, Heat. yeah. So then I was like, you know what? I was like, I can't go for Golden State. It's too much of an easy picking. Mm -hmm. so I was like, uh, let me watch basketball a little bit longer. And then I saw them in the bubble, the Hathaway Phoenix had went on a run at the end. I was like, you know what? They're going to be all right. And then they picked up Chris Paul. I was like, all right, that's my team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so yeah. in Toronto, Achi, when the Raptors were making that, was making when they were making that playoff run, um, they didn't just have the city on a buzz. They had the whole country on a buzz. Mm. Like, it was the country's team. And, um, you know, the atmosphere was crazy. Like, and it was in Ramadan, too. <laughs> so we were already on a high because yeah. it's Ramadan. Ramadan vibes, taraweeh, tahajjud fasting, all of that, you know, with the brothers and at the masjid and stuff. And on top of that, Raptors are making a playoff run. Yeah. So I remember, subhanAllah, and I showed you the video of... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were did. actually having iftar at uh, one of the, you know, Somali restaurants in Toronto. And it was... Uh, uh, we are having iftar and the game was about to end. Uh, and then we were trying to wa finish having iftar and watch the game. Yeah. <laughs> the end of the game, then run to Taraweeh. Yeah. We I was leading this, Taraweeh. This finals? This is... Uh, this was in the... Uh, Eastern Conference, Eastern Conference yeah, Finals. Yeah, because obviously yeah. Game Eastern 7 stuff. So the Philly, oh, the Philly game. Oh, that, was, yeah. that was the semis, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's why, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I showed him the video. I have a video of that yeah. actual shot. So we're there. Like, we're about to go to Taraweeh and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm thinking about what I'm going to lead, what I'm reading and stuff like that. Same time, we're watching the Raptors. Everyone's wearing their thobes, their kufis and everything. <laughs> yeah. So we go, my friend, we're watching the game and stuff like that. And then Kawhi goes, gets the ball, yeah. runs to the right side, yeah. goes to the corner, fade away. Clank, clank. <laughs> oh, he hits yeah. it. Yo, we went crazy. Yeah. <laughs> we went crazy recording it. So I'll show you guys the video after. And uh, subhanAllah, man, it was like the the, the had the, the whole city was going crazy. Yeah. Um, there was like daily celebrations downtown. Yeah. Like after every win. Because there's this place called Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jurassic Park <laughs> is like outside the stadium, yeah. outside the, 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 the Raptor Stadium. And it's like basically a place where they have a big monitor where you can watch the game for free. Yeah. And before it was just a normal place. Like if you wanted to just go down and chill and watch the game, yeah. <laughs> you could go do that. But it got so hype that people were camping out in Jurassic Park the night before the games. 
Just to watch it, yeah. Just to watch it the next day. Yeah. To be there at Indras. Drake would show up. Yeah. He would make a, a special boy. appearance. <laughs> 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 he would show up and he would, you know, shout out the guys, the people in Jurassic Park. So people were there during the in the rain, yeah. whatever the conditions were. For sure. And um uh, you know, we were our, the message I was leading at uh, Mesha Toronto at Adelaide was in downtown Toronto. Yeah. So we'd like literally pray, and if the rappers won after we pray, we'd go for a spin in the city, <laughs> and literally people were going crazy. It doesn't matter what you were wearing, yeah. what your back, your skin color, yeah. bro. It was, it was all bro. love. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, Subhanallah, I have some funny videos, man. I have this one video yeah. of like it was like the 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 it was like the the break between the the, the rakaat between the, the <laughs> prayers and tarawih. <laughs> And my friend literally is listening to the lecture. The sheikh was giving a reminder in the masjid. Yeah. And at the same time, he had like the Raptors <laughs> Golden State game playing on his phone. Yeah. So I have this video of me recording like the sheikh giving the reminder, the sheikh giving the reminder, and then like putting it on my friend yeah. and then putting it down and seeing him like watch the game, but same time trying to listen to the reminder. In, it got Ramadan. To the, in Ramadan. It got to the point where like people were like constantly checking the score, constantly trying to see, especially the games that were ending a little later during yeah. Taraweeh. So I remember in one masjid, actually, one of the bigger masjids in Toronto, yeah. after the four rakahs, when the GM, uh, general manager of the masjid, would stand up and give an announcement or whatever, um, he saw everyone was just on their phone. Everyone was, like, trying to check the score. Like, yeah. like oh, Allah, Allah. <laughs> everyone was, like, trying to check the, it was, was the <laughs> How's it looking? Did they win or not? And then he, he literally stood up yeah. before he gave an announcement. He said, everybody just put your phones away. Yeah. I'm just going to let you guys know the Raptors won. Yeah. Khalas, the Raptors won. So... Put your phones away. You can focus on your taraweeh now. Because people yeah. weren't able to focus. Everyone was trying to yeah. follow the score and, and, and see what happened and stuff like that. He said, listen, guys. Raptors won the game. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if anyone said takbir or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's a little unnecessary. But um, then he told everyone, don't worry. Just put your phones away. Inshallah, focus on your yeah. uh, the last four rakas that we have. Witr. Make your dua. And then after that, you can watch the rest of the, the yeah. highlights when you get home. So... Actually, it was it was a crazy time, bro. It yeah. was a crazy time in Toronto. It would like, it would have been a tough Ramadan too, as well. Think about it, because it went to a game seven as well. Mm-hmm. That 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 final series went to a game seven. It's in Ramadan. It's at night time as well. When it's like you're trying to like maximize your ibadah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was in the last ten nights. Uh, <laughs> that would have been probably worse. I can't remember, but uh, I think it ended maybe before the last ten. Yeah. But uh, it was a crazy time. Like honestly, sometimes the games would finish before Taraweeh. Like yeah. they'd finish and then it would be Taraweeh time. Sometimes it'd be a little later, especially when it was in the West Coast mm-hmm. when they actually went to the finals and they were playing Golden State and Golden stuff State, like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was the city was was buzzing, man. The city was, was summer buzzing. Or winter at the time. It was the it, it was, was the summertime, summer. yeah. Summer it was summertime. Oh, let me see. Is it, it get hot? Does it get hot ish there? Yeah, it gets very hot. Okay. Yeah, yeah we have some extreme heat in, in, in Toronto in the summer. Oh, heat warnings know. and stuff like that. Yeah. Just let this is see. this is a very Canadian thing, but do you guys are you do you follow the hockey over there as well? Like ice hockey? So I grew up following hockey. I grew up playing hockey. Like I used to play ice hockey growing Salmon up. Salmon played ice hockey. Yeah, I used to play ice hockey. <laughs> like with a stick. With a stick, yeah. Damn. So we had a school team, and yeah. our school used to take us. They used to provide skates and, and all the equipment for us to play. Yeah. Um, so I used to play when I was younger. But then as you grow up and, uh, you know, as those resource, resources aren't available to you, yeah. hockey is a very expensive sport to play. Yeah. You know, the skates are expensive. That's why it's like a white sport. Yeah, like yeah. you gotta need you need that <laughs> that, that, that financial backing yeah, to, yeah, to play uh, hockey as opposed to um, soccer or basketball. Yeah, true. You know, I don't know if you guys ever watched that movie um, – uh, bend it like Beckham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Bend it like. Is this what's the guy Santiago? Was that his name? Oh no, no, you're the talking kid. about goal. Goal. I'm talking about goal. goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you remember the first scene where yeah. he's like trying to play, and the guy's telling him, "Yo, you need to have shin pads. You can't play without shin pads." Mm. And then he goes, grabs a cardboard, yeah. and he <laughs> rips it, and then he puts it in, and he starts playing. That's really all you need for soccer. That's you true. You know what I mean? So, uh, and that's why it's like the world sport. It brings so mm-hmm. many people together. Um, so, yeah, I played hockey a bit growing up and then uh, for like a couple of years. And then, obviously, you know, cash was a little low. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Moved over to something more feasible, uh, you know, basketball and soccer. The double room hoops. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you, did you stop watching hockey at all? Or so, you watch at that time, I used to really follow hockey. Yeah. Like, we were crazy about hockey. Because basically, growing up, we didn't really have cable. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you got like a couple channels. I yeah. don't know if that's how it is here. Yeah. You got a couple free channels. Yeah. And one of the free channels is a very Canadian channel, yeah. you know, where you got hockey night in Canada, Saturday yeah. night, and um, CB, it was a CBC channel. Yeah. So we used to watch a lot of hockey because it was just whatever was available to us. <laughs> um, so we watched a lot of hockey. I was a crazy uh, Toronto Maple Leafs fan. 
Yeah. Like I could name all the players right now. Like all the guys used to play the, for, for the for, for the the Toronto Maple Leafs. I was a crazy Maple Leafs fan. Um, we used to get like um, crunch up a piece of paper, yeah. make it into like a paper ball, and used to like make it a little like <laughs> actually like play on the floor, <laughs> like live on our knees. Like <laughs> we'd actually like someone, my brother would be in net. The net would be like yeah. the, the wall, and do those two things, and we would literally just like. Pretend like we're playing and, and shooting stuff like that. That's Downbad.com, you know. <laughs> <laughs> in the hood, bro. Just, you know. <laughs> that's so different to us over yeah. here because the closest thing we've got is like that's like an Australian thing. AFL. Is, like, AFL, AFL, basically. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? But I heard you went to crazy. the ground. The yeah. They won the ground. Oh, you yeah. know, he, w- he went to the ground. Did you get on MCG? A- MCG? Yeah, 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 yeah. I met that um, brother. Oh, yeah. Bashar? Bashar, yeah. Bashar uh, uh, Huli. Um, it's like maybe the first or second week I was here. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, so. I went there and I spoke to their academy, the, the students there. Yeah. And then, alhamdulillah, they, they were training on the field. And I went down to the field, took a bunch of pictures and stuff like that. That's Sohail's cousin. Okay, mashallah. Yeah, yeah, good bloke, good bloke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good bloke. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, was, I was on the MCG uh, two days ago as well. Mm. Were you? Yeah, I got uh, photos. At I'll, the prove match? I'll prove it. At the whole match? <laughs> no, no, no. Was well, your first time there? Whole four match. You want to laugh? Is so it? Sunday, whole four match, I was in the bleachers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was at the top. You know, the like nosebleeds. Nosebleeds, sorry. Yeah. Nosebleeds. <laughs> and then the next day, I was out on the field. Yeah, it crazy. just trips uh, me out how the way come up is crazy. So yeah. hard. <laughs> I was like, we made it, yeah. Oh, the come down. <laughs> I was in the suit. But um, yeah, alhamdulillah. Nah, but he's um, he's a good guy, subhanAllah. Mm. Bash. Yeah, he's yeah, done mashallah. a lot for, mashallah, for the community. I don't know how involved you are. Yeah, yeah, I heard a lot of things, mashallah. Was, it, was that the first you, week you were in Australia? Because you've been here, what, like five weeks, six weeks? Seven weeks now. Seven weeks well, now, seven yeah. Weeks, yeah. yeah. And that was like the first two weeks you did that. That was literally within the first two weeks. Surely you're staying. Huh? Surely you're staying. Shalom, I'll be back for sure, but yeah, you have to. We'll see if it's going to be Canadian permanent or not. His blood. Yeah. Is, is Toronto tight knit? The community is is it a massive place or it's is a it big city? But Melbourne's a big city too. Is it? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, it's it's pretty wide, like it's, it's spaced out. Toronto's a big city too. There's a lot of suburbs now on the outside. There's like Toronto and then the the GTA Greater mm. Toronto area, mm. which is like with I all the suburbs. How's they get a different GTA? Uh, different <laughs> type of GTA. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I actually never played GTA <laughs> ever in my life. That's good. Um, yeah, fun w- fact. W- what's the differences you've realized between um, the two places that you've been to, obviously, Melbourne and Toronto? Because people say often, like, the people are pretty similar, like Canadians and Australians. Yeah. Are, like, very similar. Yeah, very similar. Um, cities look alike. Yeah. You know, we have streetcars also in the city. and Streetcars? Uh, yeah. Trams, trams. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, um, Did you call it street cars? Street cars, Do yeah. Do you guys have hook turns as well or not? Huh? Do you have hook turns as well or not? <laughs> What's that? He's pulling. So well, they don't know what hook H- turn Hook is. turn? Bro, it's hook a turn. Melbourne thing. Yeah, so when you're, when you're say, for, say for example, you're in a city, the there's a tram. Thing. Yeah, yeah, there's a tram. <laughs> in order for you to turn right in the city, you have to actually go to the left lane I turn right from the left lane. And you got to go into like a box or something, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that. I was like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> I drive in the city sometimes when I go for work. People just turn. People don't care. Mm. Like a lot of the time, you know? It's yeah, just you, bro. Yeah. So people. <laughs> Follow the law. <laughs> yeah. I've been driving uh, ever since I got here too. Yeah. What's that been like? Uh, it's been pretty easy. Yeah. Um, uh, I was a little nervous in the beginning with the roundabouts. Mm. Oh, because oh, the opposite mm. side. Yeah. Actually, we have, I think, two roundabouts in the entire city of Toronto. Yeah. What? Yeah, we don't have roundabouts. Yeah. We have uh, four-way stops. You get yeah. to the thing, you stop, you look right, left, no one there, you, then you can go. Mm. So I, I was nervous with the roundabouts in the beginning. Yeah. And then, alhamdulillah, I got comfortable. Just give way to the right. Mm. You know what I mean? Signal, whatever. Alhamdulillah, I got used to it. Overall, alhamdulillah, no accidents. Yeah. Never got, no, 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 you look good, sir. So. Yeah, I'm <laughs> still. <laughs> but, but one time, uh, or actually twice, I was on the... F- no, I don't know I was on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I just already got it. <laughs> We're holding hostage in Melbourne, though. Uh, <laughs> I don't know who watches your, your podcast. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, one time I wasn't paying attention yeah, yeah. while I was driving. We'll I, was coming out. Out, I was coming out of the parking lot. Yeah. I actually, out of Preston. Yeah. And I wasn't really paying attention. So I naturally just turned into the right lane. Okay, yep, gotcha. Mm. And I didn't even know. I'm like just turning. Like it's yeah. just clockwork, right? Oh. So I turn. I'm in the right lane. And then as I'm driving, I'm just like, you know. I see two headlights <laughs> coming my way. I'm like, yo. What's I, going on? <laughs> I changed lanes. So that happened twice. Oh, man. Recently, subhanAllah, when I was going to uh, Deakin University. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's like there? a 7-Eleven. Yeah. I forget the street name. There's a 7-Eleven right at the corner of the gas station. Yeah. 
And I was like, okay, there was a lot of traffic. It was like uh, five, 6 p.m. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yo, I got to stop for gas. But at the same time, I got to, it's going to be tight. So like one of those ones, like if you get in off the road, yeah. it's going to be hard to get back on the road because yeah. there's so many cars going. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, but nice. That, that those two lanes are open going the, the way I need to go. Yeah. <laughs> what was those two lanes? The two lanes, it was just two lanes going in the direction that I needed. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm going to go into the 7-Eleven, get my gas and come out the other side. And yeah. I'm going to, because yeah. I'm a driver, like even in Toronto, like alhamdulillah, I'm a pretty experienced driver and stuff yeah. like that. So I'm like, I'm going to jump out, go in back into the road. Because I hate those ones where like you got to beg a person to let you in. You're like, yeah. hey, hey, please let me in, especially downtown. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to jump in there, get gas and come around. So I get my gas, I pay for the gas, I come around and I'm like, I didn't even, I'm like, oh yeah, the, the two lanes are open. So bam, I hit the right yeah. and I'm going to the intersection. I see a lady making a left into the two lanes that I'm Whoa. in. And then I realize I'm like, yo. Yeah. <laughs> the I'm, reverse like, though. I'm going, this is the opposite. I have my coupe. I'm like this quick. <laughs> I don't want to be like, this. <laughs> look at this Muslim guy. What's he doing? <laughs> you know? I'm like, I'll take that one on my chest. <laughs> if you see my face, but yo. That was you. I took the coupe out. <laughs> the lady, the white lady, she's like, what? She, she makes a like turn. That. And I'm like literally in front of her. And I'm like, yo, my bad. And then bang, reverse. I honestly, bro. It's crazy, man. It's yeah. just, I didn't know what I was thinking. I thought those two lanes were going straight. Yeah. It was actually the opposite direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. yeah, subhanAllah. That's crazy. Alhamdulillah, yeah. wasn't worse. Alhamdulillah. What would you say, quick one, because we're going to start to wrap up the episodes, um, was your memorable experiences being here for like, what, seven weeks now in Melbourne? Yeah, I've been asked that question in the last couple of days yeah. by some different people. And honestly, my answer has been that, um, Alhamdulillah, you know, meeting the different people. Yeah, I think I've been, especially being at Preston, like from Asa to Aisha, um, you know, six days a week. Yeah. I've been able to meet a lot of different people in the community, uncles, you know, used to go for iftar at the masjid with the brothers um, Mondays and Thursdays and the young guys going playing basketball on Wednesdays, yeah. um, my in-laws and stuff like that. And uh, obviously you guys, mashallah, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, that's been the best part. That's been the highlight, honestly, the memories that I have with the people that I've met here mm -hmm. and, the you know, the connections that I've made. And just staying in contact with, you know, you guys and everyone else, even after, you know, I leave now and travel uh -huh. until I come back and so on. That's been the highlight, honestly. Everything else, you know, you take a picture, you know, you know, you remember, yeah. you remember what happened, you know, whenever you see that picture. But other than that, just, yeah, the connection, the, the real life human mm -hmm. connection that I've made with people. Don't worry, we'll come and know you in Regent's Park, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you live now, still? So, right now, I'm in Medina, Sheikh. I'm saying in Toronto, though, like when you do no, go no, back. No, no, we moved out. We, yeah. we don't live there. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, Where do you live? GDA? I live or in... Uh, Etobicoke. GDA, what's GDA? Greater Tunsay. GTA, GTA. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's a little too quick, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah now I live in the, the west side now, in Etobicoke. Okay. Yeah, it's an area called Etobicoke. You made it out. A lot of Somalis out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Maybe yeah. we'll come visit one day there. Oh, yeah. We'll go to Medina as well. I haven't, I haven't been to Toronto. I haven't been to Toronto. We'll go to Medina yeah, first. on the list. <laughs> Medina. Bro, they're gonna, he's going to be studying, bro. I don't sign at any time, bro. I will throw a book at us. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any more? Because I know you had your. Nah, nah, nah I'm, I'm wrapped. The I was yes. gonna wrap up the episode unless what? you had something to touch on to. Um, what? Is there something you wanted to touch up on? No, nah, no, nah, just the. You, I think you wanted to bring up the. Did, did you want to bring something? No, up? Mufti Munir. Yeah. Oh, we could touch a little about that. Yeah, because yeah, obviously, I don't even know if our audience knows Mufti Munir. Really? It's one of those things. You're going to know now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going you to learn today. Yeah. AKA Hadith Disciple. Yeah, well, subhanAllah, because obviously when I first met you at Pastor Mosque, like obviously that's my local mosque, I saw your Instagram and stuff and I knew Hadith Disciple. And it's just one of those things where, like, when we got Abu, Sheikh Abu Tamir on, it's like for us, we live so far away from Canada and America. So when we meet people and like, yeah, I know that person, it's like people from Australia, like, oh, do you know Sheikh Bilal? It's like, yeah, of course. But it feels so weird because they're so distant away. So when I found out that you knew Mufti Munir, it was like just a big shock. Because mm. like, but he's in America, like how do you, mm. and obviously you're in North America, you travel around and stuff like that. But I thought it would be good if you can kind of touch on that because I feel like Mufti Munir, for people that do follow his channel, like Hadith Disciple, that group, they're giving a lot of ilm out. Like there's so many brothers posting contents. Like I've seen the books they go through. It's like a whole tight-knit community mm -hmm. that he's really trying to, you know, and we know he's active, like you said, he's traveling all around. So maybe you could even touch on, like, maybe touch on how you met them, like we spoke about before, mm -hmm. then even like what they're doing, what you're trying to, you know? Because yeah. it's something you want to do, like, you want to go back and try to do more courses with them or classes. So, with uh, Sheikh, our you know, good brother, Mufti Munir, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him and keep him safe. And uh, I met him in Toronto during his first trip to Toronto. 
Are you guys aware of Mufti Munir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hadith disciple. Hadith disciple. <coughs> so before he came to Toronto, I was already a Hadith disciple because I was following his page and following his lectures and stuff like that. So following you makes you a disciple. Like I mean, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, yeah. basically, you know. Um, I cool. was, you know, it's not a call. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I was following him and 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 you know, learning a lot from him. And then when he came to Toronto, I finally met him the first time. Um, and ever since then, alhamdulillah, he's visited Toronto <laughs> several times. Because obviously, he comes and he's a popular individual. Like he comes to most. Mm. Like you saw when Sheikh Abdul Hamid came here, mm. people are running at him. Like there's 20, 30 people. Always. Mm. How'd you build the connect? Like you just. I kind of like uh, introduced myself. You got uh, how old were you, by the way? Fanboy them, huh? <laughs> how old were you? When this uh, happened? Honestly, what that's gonna be like maybe twenty four. Okay, so it's after your hips journey, just so I know, like the yeah, level yeah. you were at. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So I had already been studying for several years with mm. Sheikh Bukhari. Mm. You know what I mean? And and uh, alhamdulillah. So when I met him, you know, I introduced myself and told him, you know, I'm a hadith disciple. I've been following him. So he's like, cool, cool. You know, he hears that a lot, obviously, right? Mm. And then I kind of like shadowed him. Uh, mm. During his trip, and how'd you get that? You just asked if you could. Yeah, I was close yeah. to the masjid that brought him, mm. and uh, they kind of like told me, "Yeah, just look after him, take him here." Or when he was going to different places, I would go with him and stuff like that. And ever since then, we kind of like built a, a good relationship. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, we stayed in contact even when he left. And ever since then, alhamdulillah, it's been the rest is history. We really, uh, we have a really good relationship. People think, or people actually know me as a student of uh, Mufti. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, is a student of Mufti Munir And I am a student of Mufti Munir But not in the way that people think mm. I've actually never studied with him formally Like I've never actually sat down and studied with him Like you know a book mm. cover to cover One on one or something like that mm. Or in a class Other than the stuff that I've studied on YouTube with him um, But mainly um, it's been his mentorship mm. He's mentored me a lot um, When it comes to ilm And even life in general mm. You know what I mean One of the best quotes that I've heard um, I actually got from him and he passed it down to me from one of his older heads. And he, I, I called him one time. I was like, Sheikh, I was like, yo, I'm going through the situation, bro, blah, 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 blah. And then he told me, listen, man, I'm going to tell you what one of my older heads told me back in Philly. He said, be where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. You know, so uh, when he said that to me, it really helped me, you know, go through that situation and get through it. And, uh, yeah, he's mentored me a lot, like I said, in ilm and deen and also just life in general. Um He's a very, you know, loving and caring uh, person. He's very humble, very, very humble, and uh, very down to earth. Like I said, you know, he could sit down with anyone and have a conversation with them, whether they're into him, whether they're not, you know, whether they want to talk about life, um, you know, different things. He's just very down to earth. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, um, when it comes to the YouTube channel and like doing some of the classes that I do on YouTube on his on his page, Hadith Disciple. Uh, basically, what happened was I was doing classes in Toronto. And I used to live stream it on Facebook and stuff like that just for people to watch. And then someone at the mission one time was telling me that they won't be here for some of the classes and they wanted to catch the classes. They didn't want to miss the classes. So I was like, um, you could just watch it on Facebook. And they're like, oh, I don't have Facebook. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Who has Facebook, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was like, okay. He's like, why don't you just post it on YouTube? I'm like, I don't have a YouTube channel. Yeah. And I'm not about to start one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and then I thought of, you know, why don't I, why don't I ask Mufti? to maybe just use Hadith Disciple and just live stream the classes there and then just tell people to watch it there. So I literally just texted him. I said, Assalamu alaikum mufti. Someone's just asking for the classes to be recorded online. And, you know, can I just put on Hadith Disciple? He, he's like, yeah, of course. And then he sent me the login information literally in that uh, moment. And he I said, can. you know, and, and, and that's that, that means a lot for someone like, obviously your YouTube page, something you build, you know, 20K plus, uh, yeah. uh, what's it called? Subscribers. Subscribers and stuff like that. It's You're not going to give your password out to anyone, yeah. right? So, alhamdulillah, he trusted me with it. And uh, ever since then, I've just been, you know, whenever I would do a class in Toronto, I would just live stream it on Hadith Disciple. And, uh, yeah, the rest is uh, history, you know? Does he, have, does he have a good password, you reckon? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Philly uh, cheesecake or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, good, I just wanted to touch on Mufti Munir because, mashallah, um, he has a very different approach to even teaching ilm. Like, obviously, like you said, he's a very learned person. Mm -hmm. But then when he speaks, it's like what so how I was saying, like, at the expert level, he makes it so simple. And he also, he relates a lot of the time, like, it's not just, obviously, Islamic scholars. It's, you know, schol it's ilm of the West, mm -hmm. as they say. And he kind of morphs them two together mm -hmm. into an approachable, digestible way that even someone who isn't a talib al-ilm, like you said, a person before that just wants to get the basics of life, they can come to him. Is there something that you maybe you saw or you spoke to him about that kind of shows how he kind of merges both of them together? Yeah, so with Mufti, um, 
I think it's the experience that he has. He was, <coughs> excuse me, he was an imam in uh, in uh, in the states before he even went to uh, travel to seek knowledge in, in Yemen and in Saudi and stuff like that. He was he had already memorized the Quran in in, in Philadelphia. Mm. He had studied and learned Arabic on his own with his teachers and stuff like that um, before even traveling. So he has a lot of experience dealing with people. I think he's he was leading prayers and being an imam since. <coughs> maybe 16 17 or something like that maybe even maybe 19 i might be wrong mm-hmm. but um uh so i think that really helps with uh you know his delivery and how he uh um gives you know uh, everyone the knowledge that he has in like bite sizes that they can absorb and they can take um and just i feel like yeah definitely just the, the fact that he has deep knowledge in, in what he studied and stuff like that and not just like surface knowledge you know that's why he's that was makes that's what makes him stand out when he's able to you know share that knowledge at a level where um, people, you know, the regular person can benefit from it, the student knowledge will benefit from it, and even someone who's more learned than that will benefit from uh, his words and stuff like that, you know. Alhamdulillah, and you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he grants uh, wisdom, hikmah to, to who, he, who he wills and who he wishes, and uh, definitely Mufti, <coughs> you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with uh, that ability to, uh-huh. you know, really um, take these, like, uh, intricate concepts sometimes and, and, and give it to people in a way where, you know, they can uh, benefit from it. Mm. And, uh, Sometimes, you know, especially with dealing with just people, Muslims, uh, r- you know, layman Muslims, uh, you have to understand, and this is one thing that Muslim, Mufti really understands, and it's very evident in his videos and his answers, that with these type of people, a lot of times less is more. Mm. Like, you're actually doing them a favor by keeping it simple. You know, you're doing this layman person a favor by giving them a direct, straight, simple answer, as opposed to getting them into, you know, yeah. the scholarly debates and stuff like that. Mm. And there's a time and place for that, for a student knowledge and a mm. scholar and stuff like that, but... Uh, you know, a lot of times less is more, and sometimes you're, as a student knowledge, you're doing uh, this regular person, this layman who's asking you a question, a disservice by getting them into the differences of opinions and stuff like that, where now this person is actually more confused than before, mm-hmm. than, than b- when before they asked you, you know? Mm-hmm. So I've, I've experienced that a lot, but sometimes like I might go just ask um, a sheikh of a mosque, or you just see someone who you know is learned, I'll ask him a question, and he'll just give me the ruling, and he won't give me the lil. And he won't give anything. And then I'm like, I kind of wanted to know why. You know, like maybe mm. before, because I'm you know, like most of our generation. <laughs> still but a beginner. Yeah, still a <laughs> beginner. But then I wanted, and then now you're saying like, less is more. And it is true because sometimes if you hear it, you hear two different opinions. It's like, oh, this one's encouraged. This one is actually makru. And it's like, oh, okay, what do I do now then? Yeah. Which one do I take? I feel like, you know. That so th- I think that goes back to the whole idea or this whole understanding that a lot of people have or that's been spread where it's like, uh, the delil for this thing that you're doing, the proof for you, this thing that you're doing is this clear verse in the Quran or this mm. clear hadith, right? But that's not the delil all the times. You know, uh, sometimes the proof for something uh, is more than that. It's more in depth than that. It's the understanding of several hadith put together, the conclusion of all those mm. hadith put together, and looking at all those different hadiths. This is the conclusion to that. So mm. for a regular person, they're not ready for any of that, right? Um, there's the whole concept of usul al fiqh, right? Um, how to understand the Sharia, how to look at the verses in the Quran, how to look at the sta- statements of the Prophet Wasallam. There's all of these intricate things that go into a single ruling mm-hmm. a lot of times. And it's a lot of times, like I said, it's not as simple as, oh yeah, you do this because this hadith says that. Mm-hmm. Or you don't do that because this hadith says that. You know, that's like an oversimplified way of looking at the Sharia. You know, so uh, I think because of that, that's why people a lot of times ask, what is the proof for this, right? But a lot of times, um, uh, for some issues... If you were told the proof, you you know the person might not even be capable of understanding the the proof in the way it was understood and the understanding of the scholars and how they came to this conclusion. There's volumes of books written on this issue, and this is the conclusion or the, or the, mm. the you know the, the result of, of the all those uh, pages of, uh, of scholarly uh, debates and dialogue. And then you know uh, we expect to understand that in like one sentence or whatever. Mm. You know we just take okay, Sheikh is a halal is a haram. It's haram, it's halal. If he feels that you're capable of understanding and if it's something that can be maybe simplified to that degree where it's still given its due justice, mm-hmm. then cool. If not, then you have the ruling. Mm-hmm. Ask the people who know. If you don't know, the people of knowledge. If you don't know, you, di- you did what you're supposed to do. You got the ruling and you just move on. Mm-hmm. Move on. As you guys say, what do you guys say? Uh, off you go, or, or off you it? go? Yeah. <laughs> huh? yeah, some people say. Yeah, people say that. Off, off you go. go. Off yeah. you go. That's Australian. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, no, no, no. He's the most Maybe responsible of all of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> say leg it. That's it. Yeah, leg it. Uh, Good idea. <laughs> I think I think we'll leave it up there. But I got one final question. I just remembered to ask. Yeah, 
Um, obviously, I've been following your page for a minute now. LeBron and or Michael Jordan? Say again? LeBron or Michael Jordan? That too. That's actually a good question. <laughs> I know his answer already. We've already had this I debate. Mean, <laughs> honestly, bro, I don't even like get into that whole debate, bro. Yeah. But what was my answer, bro? <laughs> I think that I night might be giving different answers to different groups of people. <laughs> that night, you said Jordan. I said Jordan. Yeah, that night you said Jordan. Yeah, but that, yeah, that wasn't yeah. my question, though. Okay. On your page, you've got a hashtag. It's um, don't slip. And I realize you've used that for a while now. Yeah. What's the, the meaning behind that? And how'd that come to be? So I've never actually publicly explained the this don't slip hashtag. Uh, yeah. This is a fair so exclusive. You guys get a lot of uh, exclusive things going on today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Make sure we get the video to, uh, what, what, what are you saying, 200? <laughs> We're done, because I don't listen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> With don't slip, Achi, uh, don't slip hashtag. You yeah. know, if people are familiar with my Instagram page and stuff like that, a lot of times when I post videos or reminders, whatever it may be, I use the hashtag don't slip. So in the Quran, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about uh, Iblis and Adam alayhi salam and his wife and how Iblis misguided them and how he, uh, you know, he uh, led them astray, one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes what happened, he says, فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ Zalla is like a slip. In Arabic language, Zalla is like to slip or slide. Yeah. So Allah says that the shaitan caused Adam alayhi salam and his wife to slip. Mm. Right? Uh, due to what they did. So I kind of thought of that. You know? Yeah. Don't slip. Yeah. You got to try your best as a Muslim not to slip. Ashram. Not to let the shaitan get the best of you and, and, and make you slip. Uh, so that's kind of uh, how I got the... Uh, I oh, I got the name. That's a fairly good I thought it was yeah. related to basketball or something, honestly. <laughs> honestly, because he's, 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 he's more Dean-focused than basketball, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I'm posting a reminder, I'm kind of thinking Dean more than yeah. uh, <laughs> basketball. But, I mean, I, I got handles, but I'm, 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 I'm not, I haven't been known to <laughs> yeah, yeah. make guys slip and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> we'll leave it there, we'll leave yeah, it there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for watching this video. Um, make sure, first, and any parting words, by the way? Like, where people can find you and whatnot? Um... I've never done that either, yeah. but uh, I guess I have an Instagram page, yeah. Al Habashi, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes I'm on Hadith Disciple, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a Facebook page. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a <laughs> Send me a friend request <laughs> <laughs> if you're an uncle or. I don't know what's up, Bikum. That's about it. I got Twitter too, but I don't really, I'm not too active okay. on it. But And now you're just so people know you're continuing your studies at Medina, inshallah? Yeah, inshallah. I'm going to be traveling very soon to Medina. Shout back to Medina, continue studies there in Medina, inshallah. Yeah. You know, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it beneficial. I mean, I mean, I mean. Enjoy your flight out, inshallah. And when you come back to Melbourne, say hello to us, say g'day or something. G'day, g'day, mate. G'day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys for listening to this amazing episode. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. All of that. All the whole lot. Peace. <laughs>